Hi everyone and thank you for joining us. My name is Emily and I'm one of the programmers at the Maisel's Documentary Center, which is a nonprofit documentary cinema and education center in Harlem. Um, of course, right now operating entirely virtually. I'm really delighted to introduce tonight's conversation, which is part of Instant Ancestry, Home and History Through the Black Archive. This is a new program of short experimental documentaries by black filmmakers, each which incorporates archival materials in a variety of ways to upend identity and perception. This program is um, and has been a collaborative effort as part of the ongoing Black Doc series and is being co-presented by the Luminal Theater, Speller Street Films, and the Maisel's Documentary Center. Instant Ancestry was formed around the notion that the archive has never been a neutral body of material. Documents, images, and ephemera, which are often viewed as objective witnesses to history, themselves reflect the power dynamics and the material conditions under which they were made and collected. Drawing on a wide range of archival material, the filmmakers in this program attempt to cohere questions of Black identity that have been obscured, suppressed, or erased by white supremacy and other dominative forces. The eight films in this program together um, attempt not to instantaneously recover lost uh, or retrievable histories, but to illuminate gaps in the archive, as well as the active and ongoing process of filling those gaps. So uh, today's conversation is between filmmakers Kat Jones, Terence Price II, and Ephra Masili. Kat's film, I'll Finish When I Can, Terence's Dancing in the Absence of Pain, um, and Ephraim's Movie Tote um, are included as part of this series with several others and are available online um, at a sliding scale through November 26th. Uh, and the conversation is gonna be moderated by Curtis Caesar John, executive director of the Luminal Theater and Christopher, Christopher Everett, founder of Speller Street Films. Um, Curtis and Christopher together founded the Black Doc series, which is an initiative to help build an authentic documentary film culture within the African-American community through film screenings, webinars, and interactive film events. Um, so with all that, I'll turn it over to Curtis and Chris to introduce our panelists. Cool, well, thank you, Emily, for the warm introduction. Really appreciate it and love working with Maisel to put this program on of these fantastic filmmakers, three of whom are joining us here tonight. Um, I'm gonna do some quick introductions of the filmmakers and then uh, Chris will get started with the questions. Um, for the audience, if you have any questions, um, we'll probably be starting to take questions around 7.35 or so. So feel free to put those in the Q&A chat box and we uh, will answer those as best as we can. All right, so um, um, our first filmmaker tonight is Terrence Price II. He is a photographer and filmmaker from Miami, Florida. He has created newfound relationships collaborating with directors in Chicago, Los Angeles, and his hometown, Miami. Terrence's street photography is a form of documentation that seizes on the highs and lows of family life and the surrounding community. He aims to capture moments that, deep, that move him deeply and invites the viewer to share in this experience. Terrence most recently served as the assistant camera person for Farron Hume's short film, Liberty, which won Best Narrative Short at the 2019 South by Southwest Film Festival. And Farron's actually one of my, uh, I used to work with Farron back in the day. She volunteered with uh, one of my old festivals. So that's family right there. Uh, so thank you, Terrence, for joining us and for sharing your wonderful film. Um, Ephraim Asili, is an African-American artist, filmmaker, and DJ whose work focuses on the African diaspora as a cultural force. His works are screened in festivals and venues all over the world, including the New York Film Festival, Toronto Film Festival, Ann Arbor Film Festival, San Francisco International Film Festival, Milano Film Festival, um, International Film Festival of Rotterdam, and at MoMA PS1, La Mocha, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and Whitney Museum in New York. Um, Asili resides in upstate New York and is a professor in film and electronic arts department at Bard College. And his most recent film, Inherit The Inheritance, is um, playing in the film festival circuit right now. Uh, and Kat Jones is an artist based in Los Angeles, working with fabrics, photography, digital mediums, and audiovisual mediums to express his connection to life, the unknown, and his past. His projects, seek to uplift the voice from within and to encourage 
others to share their truth in ways that are therapeutic and healing. CAT centers his work around those who identify as Black, trans, and queer in ways that are inviting and warm. He uses his 10 years of nonprofit relations to gauge his work and influence the narratives that are necessary to highlight. CAT has generated features with online platforms such as Nylon Magazine, Huffington Post, New York Times, Rolling Stone, and Vanity Fair. His first collection from Nicole Wilson was shown at NYFW at the Brooklyn Museum in collaboration with Dapper Q in 2017. He has collaborated with international agencies such as the Human Rights Initiative in Kampala, Uganda, as part of his mission to raise awareness of LGBTQ issues in the capital of Uganda. Kat has maintained a sense of importance in relation to amplifying the voices black and queer, of Black and queer people, as well as providing artistic and healing spaces for the community. Thank you for joining us all. <clears throat> cool, cool. Um, you know, I look, I'm very excited about this conversation tonight. I was telling Curtis earlier that, um, you know, I'm a documentary maker as well, but, you know, just watching you, you guys and your work over the past uh, few days has really inspired me to start dabbling in the experimental form. So for those who aren't really familiar with your work, I'm gonna start with you first, Terrence. Um, for those who aren't familiar with your work, um, how did you get started in telling, you know, and doing documentaries in experimental form? Um, well, I started off as a street photographer uh, back in like 2006 and just documented my community and my friends. And um, so it came from, you know, being able to to uh, feel as natural as I can in a space. And then I wanted to try to like put it into a, sorry, put things into, into motion because um, Miami is full of so much and so many things out here are starting to disappear. So I saw an importance to like, capture all these moments with family and uh, with friends. And um, I was attracted to the, the experimental side because uh, I realized that whatever materials I had, I can create something from that. And um, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, um, Ephraim, um, you next, how did you get started? Um, in telling documentaries and doing documentaries in the experimental form. Sure. Um, for me, uh, I got started. Um, my background before getting the film was more in like uh, hip hop and DJing and that sort of thing, you know. And so for me, like I was, you know, like old school, like going to the record store every weekend and buying records and finding stuff. In particular, this is like the late '90s. Everyone was trying to find the like sample sources for like, you know, tripod quest songs, that sort of thing. It was like the thing to do at that time in, in DJ culture. And for me, that, that started this process of like, what's the original? What's the original? Like, how are things built on other things? Um, and then from there, I started to get into production and that sort of a thing with uh, software like Reason and different types of software. Um, and so I was making beats and doing DJing. And I had a roommate that had just gotten this thing called Final Cut Pro. And I was like, oh, cool. It's like video editing, but it looked like, you know what I mean? In some ways, like a sequencer for, for editing music. And so I thought like, you know, I could probably edit a piece of video just the same as like chopping up like a beat, you know? Um, and like maybe a year after that, I decided to try to go to film school. And when I got there, um, I remember taking a class and they showed us this like archive of uh, just like stuff that was online. And to me, it was like the record store was like, man, here's just a room filled with sample sources that are just untouched. Like, and so that was kind of the, the first impulse. Uh, at the same time, I was in film school and, um, you know, I was a little bit older than most film students. And uh, you get to this point where you're making your so-called senior project, you know. Um, and so for me, I was old enough to go, well, I could like beg everyone I know for like $10 and make some sort of hokey, like, you know what I mean, B movie thing. Or I could just make a documentary and it'll look professional if I have like one decent camera, right? And so um, I decided to just make a documentary on that logic. And I had a background, like I was saying, in music. 
And so I was already close with a lot of the guys in the uh, Sun Ra Orchestra. And it was just this natural sort of like thing of just like, well, I'll make a documentary with them. And at the same time, I started just trying to like teach myself how to edit by reworking um, archival footage. And, uh, you know, and that's how the film Movie Tote came about, which is kind of very first experiments and kind of messing around with these online materials. Cool, cool, cool. Um, Kat. Um, how did you get started um, in, in doing documentaries in the experimental form? Um, hmm, how did I get started? It's interesting because like, I, I don't feel like I had a, uh, like filming was never something that I think I ever thought to really explore honestly um, and, and seriously until, um, COVID, beginning of COVID and the uh, pandemic hit. Um, before that, you know, being in college, I think I was always trying to experiment with um, just different ways to be creative, whether that was, uh, you know, taking my little point and shoot camera out and um, going around and taking pictures of whatever I was looking at that inspired me or made me happy or um, recording whatever I felt comfortable recording and then putting that down. Um, and I think, I think it's like Microsoft Movie Maker or whatever like software that like comes with your laptop. Um, I think that was probably the extent to um, me filming anything really. And I think that when COVID hit, um, I definitely went inward uh, to a level that I don't think I've gone to before when it comes to um, creating something and uh, trying to pull from my own life experiences and, and what I'm going through and what I'm feeling and how can I like archive this moment and um, go back on it, go back to it and re refer to it for whatever. Uh, and so I think that during the beginning of COVID, I, like around like March, April, um, that's when I really started to explore it. And I, and I felt like I wanted to unpack some things that I never really um, unpacked before um, or really dissected and thought about. And yeah, I, I was definitely more experimental this time around with, um, you know, pulling out documents that I had in my case folder and um, recording them and, and, and trying to put together, like, what is it that I wanna see and what is it that I want others to see uh, when it comes to the story on my life. Um, and, and playing around with voiceovers and playing around with um, adding different clips in there and, and layering. So I think I, I, I think me just wanting to unpack a lot of things that was going on internally in my life really kind of pushed me to uh, create this film um, and also push, uh, yeah, how experimental I can be with it. So, yeah. Chris, do you mind if I jump in with a question? Yeah, yeah, sure. Go ahead. It's just, it's, 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 I find it really cool that for all three of you, um, and I, I find this happens with a lot of uh, filmmakers who do experimental work, especially experimental documentaries, that y'all are all came from different mediums. I mean, for Terrence, maybe it's a little closer because photography is kind of close to film. I mean, depending on your perspective on it, but you all have come from different mediums and are so used to. Um, sourcing them in so many different ways that it seems like getting in, making a film, making successful films, experimental films, because, you know, it's not an easy thing to do, um, any film and much less experimental one. I don't want to say seemed easy because it's never easy, but it, it seemed really seamless because it's of the success that you've had from pulling them together. Can you speak on um, maybe the power then of working in those other forms and working in those other mediums and, and then bringing that to the um, experimental form? Anyone can jump in. Uh, sure, um, for, for, for me, uh, kind of in reference to what you're saying in terms of coming from a different place, like, um, I mean, again, at the time that I was getting involved in, in music, I mean, I believe at that particular window of time, there were a number of years where in the United States, uh, turntables had started to outsell guitar sales, like two turntables and a mixer had surpassed the amount of guitars being sold. Uh, I don't think that's the case anymore, but there was a brief window in time where that 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 had happened. And uh, I bring that up to say that I think, you know, I always felt strongly that I was making like music, 
like the folk music of my culture. I wasn't really interested in making something like high art. You know, it was like not only did I love the work that I was making in that art form, but that I like loved it because it wasn't like an academic thing. I didn't have to go to school. It was just like what people did. It was a cultural thing. Like it was currency in the neighborhood. It wasn't like it, it worked somewhere else. And so for me, that was the, the, the sort of initial pull of everything, kind of um, feeling that way about it. When I decided to study film, the first thing you realize when you go to film school is like, this is, uh, you know, I'll just say like an elitist uh, art form in that you really can't do it in certain ways without resources. It's just that simple. It's like you can't make, you know, so it's like you could be as, as talented as the next person, but if you don't have the, you know, multi-million dollars, you can't do certain things. And for me, I thought, you know, uh, black people, we've been pretty good at sustaining ourselves and supporting each other without having resources in just about any other realm than filmmaking, you know, and that was a sort of revelation for me, um, you know, at that time, at least this is 2006 or seven, a lot's changed in terms of the history that, you know, a lot of us weren't aware of at that time that now we're learning about the fierce history of independent black filmmaking, but point being, uh, at the time, it was something that seemed like um, it didn't have a way of being accessible to kind of to the people. Um, and around that same time, I started to discover the world of experimental film and how that was mostly white. Uh, on the other hand, it was very egalitarian, like they would like have co-ops and share. And it was like they weren't relying on anybody outside of their own community to make an audience for themselves. And then I started to kind of make just connections in my own mind about, well, wait a minute, like we could be doing that and we could be kind of operating in a different way. And then it's not no surprise that those experimental makers were primarily influenced by like avant-garde black jazz. Right. And so they're looking at our culture, building something, but we didn't necessarily do the same thing at the same time. And so for me, it was this thing of like, um, where's the avant-garde jazz of film, you know? And that was just the sort of, you know, I went in with that question and that's that was kind of the jumping off point uh, for me. Um, yeah, I think it, yeah, what you said spoke to me and it made me think about um, the people that uh, I found myself to be influenced by in terms of um, creating experimental film. Um, you know, I, I, I did like I don't have any any formal training or anything like that in film, and um, this is kind of the first. Well, this is the first like film uh, that I have put together, and I think that not having um, people in the industry, in the independent film industry or film industry as a whole, um, not seeing representation uh, or not seeing uh, people in your community. Um, on those platforms doing what it is that you're, you're wanting to do or curious about doing um, really kind of impacts your ability to even uh, start the process or even figure out, okay, is this something that I wanna do or do I feel like I could do it? Um, Cause I, I, I see a lot of filmmakers and I'm like, wow, okay. There's support, there's, there's the technology, there's the connection, there's the, uh, the tools, all the things that you need to create this this film that's gonna be seen and it's gonna have an impact on all these things, right? Um, but not thinking about like accessibility and how that impacts your ability to tell a story um, or to convey whatever it is that you wanna convey. And I think like, for me, it goes back to not having those resources at all. Um, you know, I was was fortunate enough to save up and, you know, buy like a little, uh, not little, but like to buy a Nikon camera. And I have my I have my phone here and I have my laptop. Um, I don't have any external equipment. I don't have you know all the other things that you could use to create an experimental project or whatever. Um, and working with what I have to uh, showcase what I feel, um, you know, that feels really empowering. And I, I think about uh, people who are within the queer community who I look up to in terms of film, um, like Alima Lee. Uh, putting together really experimental work. And you can see that there's a lot of working with what's around me um, as opposed to, you know, I have all these affluent high connections and I'm, I'm gonna use that. So I appreciate projects where uh, you see more of themselves and you see more of um, 
the community coming together also to make the project work. Um, but yeah, so I, I, I resonated with that, with what you shared. Yeah, and I'll, I have to agree with everybody to, you know, using the materials that you have to like make this piece. And um, I come from a place of photography and the type of photography that I do is very analog. So I'm already like engaging with the film and like touching it and loading it into the camera. Like I'm being, I'm becoming as much of the process of creating something as I'm performing and like going outside and whatnot. So yeah, just like putting things together, it just, uh, it keeps you with like this level of care that goes into the work. And um, for what gets me into like experimental work is like, uh, you know, in the film, my grandfather, he would always like document us with his camera. And with pictures, it is nice to like see the picture and like how old it is and like to touch it and everything. But it's something so much more like when you see yourself in that camera and you hear everything, uh, the weather, the time of day, and um, just like putting those elements all together, especially in an experimental film is something that I'm really proud of and how I transitioned into it. And, um, you know, it's like my grandmother going into the kitchen, you know, and making a meal out of nothing. And I feel like that's what I'm doing in the uh, experimental world. I'm still new to it. I'm still getting used to it, but it's all growth and whatnot. So, yeah. Cool, cool. Um, <clears throat> I guess to just, uh, I guess, piggyback off off of your film, Terrence. Um, kind of want to get into, uh, you know, into all three or three of y'all's film that that are in films that are in Instant Ancestry. Um, Terrence, you were just talking about your grandfather, and I know your film is kind of based around, you know, his 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 videotapes. So, so what made you, I guess, like, how did you, I guess, come across them? Did, or did you just stumble on them? Or did, I know you said he always uh, would video you guys. Like, so what made you want to do this type of project? Um, well, I always remember being a kid and like staying over my grandparents' house and like uh, seeing this device, this VHS player, and then, and like a little cabinet right next to it. It's just a bunch of old tapes like collecting dust. And my cousin's like sleeping over and then we will grab the tapes and just pop them in and then watch all this, this stuff. Like looking at our parents and like laughing at them of who they were back then and how hard they'd be on us sometimes. And then, you know, seeing like these connections from like the past to now. And um, when my grandfather passed away in 2018, you know, my uncle comes to me with this camera and he's like, this was your grandfather's camera and his tapes are in there. He says like, you think you know what to do with it or whatnot. So I just took the tapes and I started to play them, started to look at them. And I was just like, it wasn't like I gotta do something for, with this, but I felt like I needed to like put it together to at least show like my family, like, hey, he was always like aware in there and like paying attention to everything that was going on around them. Uh, my grandfather was a very like strict dude, pretty grumpy sometimes, but he showed his love in like other ways. So I really just wanted to find a way to like put this together so that way that love can like be seen like at least within a family. And then when I put it out there, um, everybody just kind of gravitated towards it because they saw themselves like in the piece. And, uh, so yeah, that's how that came about. Um, um, Kat, um, tell us about, you know, what, what really inspired you and in, in, in that process of doing, um, I'll finish when I can, you know what I mean? Like what, you know, what was, was going on and everything and what made you say, I want to do this and, and tell it this way? Um, hmm. Well, it's interesting because like, I feel like it's a, it's, it's an ongoing um, process and it's like an ongoing unpacking of um, this, this part of my life. Uh, it's still very new. So, you know, I, at 24, 
Um, and I think in the film, I cover this, but in, when I was 24, that was when I found out that I was adopted and um, I'm 31 now. And so, you know, some time has passed, uh, but that's, you know, it's all, it's, it's, it's relative, right? Like it's still this new thing that I'm having to unpack and, you know, um, sit with and figure out how do I feel and, and relationships with these people and, and what's coming up. And, um, you know, like even now, like I still, like I just discovered, you know, I, my uh, half sister on my father's side, you know, just, just found out about her a couple, couple months ago. So it's an ongoing process. And I think that during um, COVID, when I made the film, I think there were so many things that, that I was feeling about so many different things. Um, whether it was my relationship or whether it was my career or whether it was my family. And I think that one of the things that I felt like I could unpack and that I, I, I felt comfortable unpacking and um, doing something with was my, my family, my bio family, my adopted family, um, and my adoption and how I feel about that. And uh, there was a period where I would, I would sit in my car and I would, uh, I would record myself on my phone and um, I would just sit and I would talk for hours and hours and hours in the evening. I'm a very, I'm a night person. I'm, I'm usually up late at night. That's usually when I'm really creative and I'm really like starting to get into things. And at that time I recorded myself because I just wanted to just get out how I was feeling. Um, I didn't want to filter anything. I didn't want to, uh, you know, watch how I was, you know, coming off or anything. It was just very, it was natural. It was how I was feeling. It was just kind of like a, a, a journal, I guess, instead of writing it, I was just, you know, talking to myself out loud. Um, and then there was a period where I still had my, um, like I still have my, my case folder um, that my adopted mother gave me. Um, she told me that I was adopted that has all basically my entire file um, from, you know, the minute I was in uh, foster care up until I was adopted. So, you know, all of the reports, um, all of the, the letters and findings and, um, and studies and results and diagnosis, all these things was, was just present with me. And I think there were some things that I had just discovered and I, I didn't know that I had in that folder. And I was like, I want to, like, I want to put this, I want to, I want to, I want to get this out here. And it wasn't even necessarily something that's like, I want to, I want to show people, but it was almost like, I want to, I want to look back on this myself. Um, and so there was a moment where I just, I, I recorded um, certain parts of the documents that were new to me. Um, and I sat with it and I was like, what else can I do? What else can I, how else can I convey how I'm feeling about, you know, this document? Because when I look at it, I'm, I'm reading, you know, certain uh, psych psychological studies about me at one years old or two years old or three years old. And I'm feeling these things. Um, and so I wanna layer that with what it is that I'm seeing. And I wanna tell the story about, you know, my family and I wanna get out how I feel about my biological family and what connection I have with my biological family. Um, and you know, there's parts of it where I'm I'm talking about feeling alone and feeling like I'm not, I'm not really sure how I feel about these people in my life. Um, and at the time that I'm putting together this film and just kind of layering images with voiceovers with drawings that I've done, you know, I'm I'm doing all of this at the same time. So it's 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 a therapeutic process. Like there were many moments where I had to pause and come back to it because it was just, you know, it was heavy. You know, I'm I'm this isn't. Like this is this is this is something that I know, right? Like I know that this occurred. I know that this is part of my life. But now I'm sitting with it because I'm trying to um, put together this package or put together this this uh, this message about how I feel about the moment and the situation and the things that happen. Um, and so, yeah, it was it was just one of those things where one day I would be drawing, and you know, this drawing is in relation to. Um, my adoption, and so I'm gonna add that into the film. Um, there's another moment where I might have another conversation or I might read uh, a study about me. I'm gonna add that to the film because it's all part of 
you know, the story of my identity and my relationship to these things that, um, that happened to me in my past. So, um, yeah, I feel like I might've gone on a tangent, but, uh, yeah, I hope, I hope, I hope I answered it. I hope I didn't go off too much. I have a tendency to do that a little bit. Oh, no, no, that was perfect. That was perfect. Um, um, okay. um, Ephraim, um, with your, with your film, uh, Movie Talk, uh, I guess, how, how did you, I guess, come about deciding, you know, you want to tell the story of race and class in America. And so what made you say, you know what, I'm going to take, you know, archival video to do that. You know what I'm saying? What was the, the I guess, the inspiration really behind to, to do it that way? Right, right. Yeah, I guess it was kind of like the question kind of came after the answer and that I had made something and I said, well, what is this even about, you know? Um, and then, you know, you come to terms with what you've just made. And so I think it, that's kind of how, how it happened. But in terms of process, you know, um, you know, this is going again back to 2005, 2006 when I was making it. And like I was saying, my background was in music. And so I just, you know, up and decided to go to the local film school, which for me in Philly was Temple University. And at that time, uh, they had just switched over from actually teaching film to to video. And they brought in like computers for editing software, which to me looked normal. But, you know, apparently it was a big deal at the time. Like they got rid of the Steenbecks and, all, you know, and, like I kind of came in that first class after that. And um, at that same time, you know, things like YouTube were, were brand new. Like it was like, wow, there's this place online where you can just like put videos of of anything and maybe more impressive that impressive than that that could happen was the idea of the bandwidth that you could go to places on the internet and there'd just be thousands of things that you could just click on and they would move like in real time, so to speak. And that was still pretty new. Um, and so at that time, I was like, I was saying I was making this documentary with the uh, members of the Sunra Orchestra. And it was my first thing, but I had no background in, in editing. So I was working with a friend who was an editor. And, um, you know, I would get frustrated with the editing process, particularly I didn't like some of his edits. And like, no, I just want that there. And it would be some song and dance about like, why it takes half an hour to just move the thing there, you know, and I'd be like, you know what, I'll do it myself. Thank you. You know, so I would actually go behind his back and I would go and uh, find archival materials just to learn how to move stuff around and edit. And um, and I found myself drawn to the materials that ended up in Movie Tote. But I think one through line with all of our sort of um, relationships to experimental film, um, I think it often does come out of a sort of uh, cathartic life moment where it's a thing that particularly I can't speak for us, but in the editing process, it's very tied to your sort of nervous system in a sense that it's like what feels good you, you kind of do that and you think about it and you're responding to yourself and i think you know inevitably that becomes i think kind of uh experimental or it takes on a form that you just couldn't predetermine uh for me i was going through a really intense time in my life where i had gotten divorced um i was you know well, anyone, i don't know if anyone's seen my new film but it deals with this sort of phase of my life but I was living in a collective i'd gotten divorced i was moving out i was having a very frustrated time i moved to a different neighborhood and I was like I'm just gonna go to film school I'm gonna keep my head down and just focus you know and for a couple of months this went on and I was living in this really small alley mixed race neighborhood but I come out one day and there's like you know four feet by like three feet tall just the word like nigger just boom right on the wall like big you know and uh and it was like it could have been anyone it could have been anything um but nonetheless every day I'd walk out and I was like that that's the first thing I see stepping out of the door like every morning. And I remember thinking very consciously, like that's what I'm confronted with as I'm trying to put myself through school every morning. And I would go and I would edit this piece. And that was kind of like what I was responding to in my mind anyway, when I was making the piece. Oh man. <laughs> and this is in, uh, this is in New York, right? This is or in Philadelphia, Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, it could have been anybody. I'm not saying, you know, where it came yeah, from, yeah. wrote it, you know, it gets deep in terms of, well, if it was an A at the end or, you know, R, you know, right, 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 depends, right. you know, blah, blah, blah. Nonetheless, I, every day the dissonance is there, you know? Yeah. Right. I think it's, um, I think it's interesting what you said about like, you know, walking past that, you know, that, that thing <laughs> and that having an impact on like how you're creating your work, 
you know, and like how certain things might be shot or what might be captured and how it's captured. Like for me, I feel like that it showed itself, um, you know, like I have, uh, like I would have images of myself as a young kid and you know, from those images, you, you get you, you you get the picture of like a really happy kid, very social, very friendly, very outgoing, very just kind of like loving and 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 responsive, right? Like I'm I'm engaging with people around me, like I'm in kindergarten, I'm in preschool, I'm having fun, um, and that parallel, not parallel, but contrasting um, these documents, right? Like there's a there's a psychological study where they're um, they're saying that my you know my gait is normal or like my the APCAR scale is eight or uh, she's not able to respond to certain cues or um, she's not, uh, you know, if you call her name, she might, you know, like whatever, whatever diagnosis they might've had. And like, for me, I was feeling this sense of like, well, that it's not, it's not adding up to me. Like it's not computing. And so I think that's in the film, that's why I layer, you know, this imagery of a very happy child against, um, this 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 psychological study and evaluation of me and like their determination of who I am and what my personality is and so that being my existence you know I wanted to highlight that in the film and so I feel like that speaks to like what you're you're what you're experiencing in your life that showing up in um, your work and and how you're choosing to to highlight those those real life experiences. It's like finding and, and or working to discover the truth of who you are, who you all are in, in your films and, and I guess sourcing and looking for that um, within how you put the films together and, and, and how the world is um, able to um, see them and feel them, right? Is, is, that, is that accurate or is it something else? Right, right, yeah. Terrence, you're about to. Oh, yeah. Oh. I was just saying oh. that's that's accurate. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. There's always like these pieces, like in films, you know, that there's like a, a hidden language that translates to mm. someone, you know. And like, I was just talking to a friend of mine before I hopped on here. He lives in a community called Overtown, and then in another, yeah, he was watching a video the director was filming just this of like uh, the corner store and when he saw the ceiling of the corner store he was just corner store right up you know and like there's always like little small pieces that can uh hello 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 Oh, sorry, my connection. But yeah, yeah, you were getting a little frozen for a second. Can you just repeat that last part you were saying? You yeah, there's, always there's just place. always like these little little pieces that can translate to anybody anywhere. And I feel like we as uh, Black filmmakers uh, in experimental documentary films uh, create to like speak to uh, the people that's watching it knows what they're watching because you know it's translating and speaking to them. Yeah, that's the hidden language you spoke about. It's it's like that um, instant connection, you know. Not to take more title, but I guess I am that instant connection that that we have to our past, to our contemporary senses, or right. ourselves that that um, I guess becomes automatic because we're telling these stories and preserving these stories and these images of of who we are and um, and of our past and interpreting them and interpreting them in different ways that just tell your, that tell a life story, right? So, so yeah, it's really fascinating. I, I just, I, I, that's something we really appreciated about this entire lineup and why we thought it was so important to present it is because um, we just really wanted to make sure that our audiences are able to um, understand and, and, and in many ways enjoy and connect with, you know, how to tell um, documentary stories in different ways, so. No, I mean, I'm long winded in saying that, but you know, but thank you again for, for, for this work, because even in speaking to you all now and discovering a lot more about your processes, um, it's even more clear that um, how important it is for these, for all of your stories to like, just be centered in ways that um, 
for audiences to be able to find in, in, as, in as many places as they can. Yeah, I, I guess I would only say, or I'll add to that, that, uh, I mean, I, I think there's this idea, like, experimental, you know, it's like, it's a funny, like that term, you know what I mean? It, it, it's complicated, I would say, in some ways, in that I, I think, if we were to maybe, and again, I don't want to put words in anyone else's mouths, but like, uh, I think if we're maybe speaking more specifically about the films that we're talking about, and what I'm hearing from other people's process, it, it, it's a much more of a thing about an intuitive process as opposed to something that is like, again, I'm going to sit down and how can I make something experimental, you know, and I think sometimes when people approach art that, you know, is dubbed avant-garde or experimental, from the outside, there's this perception that you have someone who thinks they're too good to make normal things, therefore they will make these other things, you know. Um, but the reality is, it's like, no, it's like everyone's saying, it's like, you have a piece of this, you have a piece of that, you have a feeling, and you go for it. Um, in any other, I think, again, Black art form, this is this is the, the norm, and that's why we don't generally think of Black people as like making like experimental art, because it's all, it's always been experimental, if you're talking about, you know, the Western culture of, you know, making music, etc. You know, you had traditions, and then people were forced to improvise, and experiment and so it's like you know it's not historicized this way but like you know louis armstrong charlie parker whomever these are experimental artists by every stretch of the imagination um but we just don't it's just like it's so normal for us to do that that the language isn't there uh when you get to the sort of like second half of you know the 20th century there's money involved in being experimental right an experimental composer is someone who can get a grant right a black person who's messing around with form is just a jazz musician, but an experimental composer gets grant. And so you get this language that, that comes up and it becomes very formal, you know. Um, but I think at it, at its core, you know, something that we're, you know, hopefully gets gets dissolved and it's just a process of, of, of trying things, you know. Um, and I would even add that that process, you know, has its limitations. Like personally, I feel like I've done a lot of like um, intuitive work uh, to the point where it's like, okay, now, you know, I should know some things that I don't need to just have to like see what happens anymore. What can I apply what I've learned? And so then it doesn't feel experimental in that same way. Uh, but the experiments, you know, what you're trying to test, uh, it becomes different. And so I think sometimes the idea of experimental, um, it, almost as if it's a form that is there and you enter it and then you make the work. But I think generally speaking, people who find themselves in these realms are just kind of putting stuff together like you know we're talking you know the idea of cooking it keeps coming up and it's like like it's not like it's called soul food it's not called like experimental cooking right and it's like but that food is just like this that and the other right you put it all together and so I think sometimes you know it's like the language of experimental um can work against us in that I think people feel like it's you know uh like an elitist thing or trying to kind of keep people out of a conversation um, but I think, again, at its core, it's at, in fact the opposite. Like, you don't need a million dollars to tell your story. Just, like, get your camera, your phone, and some drawings, and, and you can make stuff. And I think, you know, that that's, at least for me, uh, what I've always been trying to, you know, people are like, what do you want people to take away from the work or whatever? I said, well, that's the point. It's just like, well, anyone can do it, and it's just a matter of, like, if you need to tell that story, uh, the form should be the least of your concerns, you know what I mean? It's just like getting that story out, um, that's important, you know, and, uh, and you know, um, I, I say this half-jokingly, but, um, but you know, I think, like, the world of, like, you know, Black Twitter, et cetera, memes, uh, in the widest sense of all that stuff works, has created, there's a very, like, I feel like the literacy of reading an image in terms of experimental art is much more sophisticated, like like we're talking about this idea of like an instant translation of ancestry. I think there was a point in time where it would have to look a very, like I learned how to make documentaries, I'm not gonna name names, but in a very specific way, and it's like, you know, a PBS sort of approach. And the idea was if you didn't do that, you're gonna lose a black audience, right? Because like, and then you put on some crazy avant-garde stuff and it's like, well, there are people who are steeped in the culture of photography, therefore they'll understand that. But we live in a culture where we're all being bombarded with very complicated imagery all the time. And I think the ability to read those images grows with that. And so I think um, I only see more opportunities uh, in terms of 
there being a wider audience for black experimental uh, work in that it, to me, I don't see why it would be any different than any other art form where that, that happens. And, um, and again, so I think in the future, it, what's called experimental uh, will be the norm and that it would be odd to work otherwise. Cool, cool, excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, we wanna, you know, ask the, the audience, you know, that's viewing right now with us, you know, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A um, chat box. You know, you have three very talented individuals right here, um, you know, so if you even interested in doing this type of work or you got any questions about um, their films that are currently streaming um, in the Instant Ancestry program, please um, put your questions in the chat box. Cool. So I, while the audience uh, ponders their questions, I have one more question for you all. Um, we kind of touched on this, but I want to ask it again anyway, um, maybe a little more in a more, little more specific way. So like most filmmakers, they really get caught up in um, needing lots of money to tell like really interesting stories. Can you go into a little bit um, like just like what, how much it costs you budget wise to make your films and like what was the process of uh, creating these, creating your works um, using archive materials? Um, um, Ephraim, you kind of spoke a bit about um, the editing process and taking over the editing, um, but you also source your, your materials from a particular place. Um, so can you, can you all just share with us um, about that, like the budget and um, the process of, of finding the archival material and use, finding and piecing together archive materials in different ways? Yeah. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Ephraim. Did you want to? Go ahead. Go ahead. I I feel like mine is I I don't uh, I didn't financially didn't cost me anything to do it, and I think that's because the the style of style uh, of film that I did was merely a matter of um, again working with what what was already in the kitchen, right? Like I already had these things in a fridge, so I whipped it together, um, and maybe it was just donated to me. But you know my you know the documents that I had like I said, they, you know, they were my documents and, um, you know, I didn't have to like pay for any like software or anything like that, which in a way, like, you know, it, I feel, I feel, I feel, it makes me feel proud, you know, to say that I can, I can put something out there. Um, and I know the capabilities on a small scale. Right. And I know, uh, it's potential and it's, in it's, in it's value. Um, and so that motivates me to, you know, want to continue um, and explore other avenues of filming and, and maybe, um, you know, how am I filming or where I'm filming or, or what, what tools am I using um, and, and downloading software like, you know, Final Cut Pro and figuring out how to make it more layered and complex. Um, so, yeah, I didn't, you know, I didn't have to pay for anything. So I was fortunate in that sense. So that's, yeah, that was pretty much it. I'm sorry, not to, before anyone else goes, I, I find that um, beautifully liberating in a way because I'm just thinking about your film now and just like the, um, you had a lot of like really intense layering and, and, and um, like marking techniques. I mean, which I know can be done in different places in different ways, but it, it's, it's, um, really surprising in, in, the, in all the best ways that you didn't end up spending too much on having to make that. that that's fantastic. Uh, I, I, appreciate, I appreciate that. I, I feel like I, um, like with, uh, I think it's, it's, it's movie makers, just the, you know, what, what the Apple software comes with. I think I played around with that a lot and just tried to think about films that, um, you know, I was inspired by or, you know, really caught my eye um, and not in terms of like, okay, so this is how I'm gonna do it. I'm gonna do it the exact same way, but kind of thinking about like, okay, I mean, it's the learning process, right? So I'm thinking about like, how did they go about creating this thing? And, and with, with the tools that I have, um, how could I do that while conveying what message I wanna convey? So um, I appreciate that, thank you. <laughs> Um, I mean, I feel like filmmaking, it's one of these things where, how do you say it? It attracts like a lot of like lazy, 
bougie people who wish they were like artists in a lot of ways. And I, and I, I mean, I'm not trying to be funny in a way in that I think it's like, you know, some people engage in arts because it's like something to do. Like, like I paint because I need to like be busy or whatever. People play sports because they need to move their body. Uh, but I feel like oftentimes people who are drawn to film, it's like they really do just want to like tell people what to do and sit around and so forth and so on. And so, you know, I think people get involved in film and the first thing you hear out of so many people's mouths is how they can't make because they don't have, you know, and it's like, oh, if I had money. And it's like, you know, we've all seen movies come from all sorts of communities where people don't have, re it happens all the time. If you want to tell that story better, you're going to tell the story. Now, again, it's not going to look like the Black Panther movie, but that's fine, you know. But it's like, if you're trying to tell the story, you're going to tell the story, you know. And so for me, um, you know, money is always something that I'm happy to talk about in terms of how much it costs to make a film um, because it's like, you know, I'm in a moment now where I have more money to make a film, but there were moments when I didn't have any money to make a film and guess what? I still made them, you know? Um, and so, you know, when I made Movie Tote, you know, at, at that time and these days, you know, and I'm not old at all, but it's like, uh, but I'm old enough like to remember when Final Cut and all that stuff came out, it was prohibitively expensive you couldn't have that on your computer any kind of set you know like you couldn't edit well there were no smartphones but you couldn't edit with you know you had to have resources and so for me the idea of going to film school was just like you if you wanted to learn the medium you had to either have a few thousand dollars in your pocket or you got student loans and went to film school and so I was you know taking those loans and I was learning how to edit on the school software but the only piece of equipment that I bought that I used to make my film um, was an external hard drive. And in fact, that's where the title comes from. Uh, I was accessing materials from the uh, Prelinger archive, which is free and in the public domain and was then. Um, and so I had this hard drive that I bought and uh, and I kept it in this little leather camera bag that was called a movie tote. And I would kind of carry these movies around on my hard drive, you know, and at that time, hard drives, you know, they're expensive. So I probably spent like $200 for like a hundred gig hard drive, you know, it was like, that's how it was back then. Um, but that was it, you know, and that was kind of, again, for me, the point was like, um, like I've always been attached to, again, other, other kind of, um, independent forms of black art and the independence being as important as the art. Um, and so for me, like kind of finding a way to kind of build something out of that, uh, it was important to like, you know, not be in a position like, like to be able to sit one day and be like, well, I didn't wait 10 years to make one movie because no one would give me money. It's like, there's the movies I would make if I had the resources, but here's a whole catalog of things I did when I didn't have the resources. And so um, it's definitely not about money. Uh, it's about, you know, creativity and hard cool. work. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, we have limited time and an audience has asked uh, two really great questions. So uh, Terrence, I know you wanted to chime in, but I would ask you to answer this question, um, at least be the first to answer this question. Um, Reginald O'Neill asks, um, what would you guys say is your main audience? Like what would you, and what would you want them to take from your work? And, and Terrence, before you answer that, um, I know, especially with, your film, um, I know you had mentioned a little bit in some of your bio information about uh, your family's reaction to it. So if you could just share a little bit about that as well, but uh, well also please answer the main question about um, who would you say is your main audience and what would you want them to take away from your work? Um, I mean, my main audience is to, you know, whoever, uh, whoever they, whoever feels deeply moved by it. Um, of course, I'm speaking to black families um, with this piece. Um, the way my family have uh, been uh, engaging with it, uh, they wanna show it at their family reunions. So like that, it's just, it's something that like becomes, uh, I don't know. It's heavy to think about because of especially like the time that we're in right now where I can't really like go to my grandmother or I can't go to a family who's in need. You know, I can't touch them. I can barely be around them. And to have this piece uh, that is so like heavy with like 
family and like all these gatherings and whatnot. So I'm hoping that for right now, it speaks to uh, a lot of the, the pain that some of us may be feeling, uh, the separation and having to like, you know, be on this quarantine. And um, my family's been like really cool with it. Uh, my grandmother, she didn't, the, the day I first premiered it, uh, it was at my solo show. I had got accepted to an art residency here in Miami. And that was like my only budget. I had to pay a hundred dollars a month for my studio. But other than that, I just used all the materials that I already had to make it. And uh, my grandmother, she was familiar with the tapes, but she hasn't seen it in like so long. And I invited, you know, family to come out to be able to see this piece that I made. And um, they were just like, you know, in the room. It was a very emotional night. Like everybody was crying and everything. So like something like that is like, I couldn't have asked for like a better audience. So I try not to think about too much of who I'm making it for because I feel like it'll be forced and you'll see it in the work. But in the back of my head, I do know I want this person to like really engage with the piece. Like, but it's beyond my control like once it's out there. But the way I see people being uh, moved by it lets me know that, you know, it was uh, the right, on the right path or whatever. Kat, Ephraim, would you uh, like to answer that question about um, who you feel is your main audience and what you want them to take from your work? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I guess I would say, you know, it's a tricky thing, but I would say I don't think I even have a main audience. <laughs> yeah, like, that's an aspiration, you know, it's like my, I have a main audience that watches my work, you know. Um, but it's like, I, I think of it very different in terms of like, similar to what, what, what Terrence said, you kind of, you know, you're making this work in good faith and, you know, you have your own background and your specific point of view and you hope people that share that, like that the work resonates in some deep way in that, in that way. Um, but at the same time, um, you know, when you decide as an artist, you're going to go your own way, um, you go there alone, you know, and you can't expect anybody to go there with you. Um, and so when you look back over your shoulder, you don't necessarily or you shouldn't necessarily expect anyone to be watching you go down this path right um and so you know one has to at the same time i think um try to cultivate an audience uh while cultivating oneself and that you know if you play your cards right maybe at some point you have a main audience with which to you know you know appease or or fight with um but I think if you're really doing it, uh, that's an organic process and it's something you, you look back over your shoulder one day and there are people there. Um, but, you know, who gets tuned into the work and how it resonates for them. I mean, I think there's so much, it's so hard just to be an artist and to kind of be tuned into yourself. Uh, you know, you can't necessarily be trying to kind of tune in other people and what they can get out of the work or not get out of the work, but, you know, that you just kind of go for it and hopefully that that that's something that comes with time. And, uh, and it does, I mean, I, I mean, I think history teaches us this, that, you know, when you look at any artist, that's a real innovator, first the people laugh and then they get in line, you know, I mean, that, that's just, it, it is what it is. And so, you know, whether you have an audience or not, I think is very secondary uh, to me, uh, if you're actually going down your path, if you're actually trying to have a big audience or something that's not happening, well, that's a different problem that I wouldn't know about. But, um, but for me, it's a little bit different. Um, yeah, I, I don't think I really saw about, uh, thought about an audience and like who, who this is for, um, on a, on a broader scale. Um, I definitely, uh, when I, when I, when I watch the film back and I, and I sit with it and, you know, I think about like what comes up for me, um, I think then is when I can say like, okay, well, you know, it, it would be nice if people got X, Y, and Z from the film. So for me, a few of those things would be um, being mindful of, uh, or starting a process to think about, you know, how other people's perceptions um, of you impact your life, right? And and the ways in which, um, you know, certain societal structures or certain groups that we're involved in 
um, you know, how much weight are, how much weight do they have in how I see myself? That could be, you know, black Twitter, that can be Instagram, that can be your family, that can be your partner, that can be anybody. And so on a larger scale, I think I, I definitely want people to walk away with maybe a sense of like self-reflection of like, okay, how do I see myself? Um, you know, not necessarily thinking like, okay, well, how are other people seeing me? But if they have a different perception of me, um, will I allow that to impact how I feel about myself? Um, so I think that's definitely something that I, I would want people to walk away with. Um, I think with all of the different things that I do in my creative life, um, I, I, I like I like to try my hand at a lot of different things. Um, and so in everything that I do, I feel like I'm always wanting to center um, the voices of queer people, um, especially because I feel like we don't have, uh, in terms of like archival history, like you can see that there's not an extensive amount um, of archival history when it when it relates to like black queer folks at all. And so I think it's important for me, you know, someone who does identify as a queer person um, to make sure that I'm telling my story. And over time, when I tell more stories or I, I get involved in more projects, um, there's 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 a there's archival along the way um, of my identity and who I am and what I represent and you know who I'm moving for and what I'm moving for. Um, I think with this specific film, I didn't have an audience in mind. I didn't think like, okay, I want specifically these people to pay attention to it. Um, I was talking with uh, someone the other day about the impact um, that psychologists in, in, in the field of psychology has on, um, on youth, especially when it comes to diagnosing them young and, and you know, putting this label on, um, on young people and how that can have a huge impact on how they see themselves and therefore how they're going to navigate the world. Um, and so I do think that that's a really important thing that people need to understand and really think about. Um, I don't think that anybody should be diagnosing youth younger than the age of, of, of 18. No one should be diagnosed at three years old with you know, a borderline personality or you know, ADD. I don't think that that should you know, happen at all. Yes, I am not a, a professional, but I can see how those things have negatively impacted me. Um, and so I think that that's something that's really, really important to walk away with, regardless of where you identify. I think that that's, that's something to really uh, to highlight. So that would be it in terms of who my audience would be. So, yeah. Okay, cool, cool. Um, the last question, um, it's really a, a comment and a question at the end. Um, this has been amazing. One of the awesome things it seems to me that each of you are doing is culture capture in the most positive sense of the term, whether that culture is your own family or various demographics of black people. And while we as black people are living in that culture or various culture aspects, we are in it and we see it from a close-up range. And here's the question. Um, have you found that in distribution of your films that significant segments of Black communities have seen your work so we get a wide view of seeing ourselves? And anyone can take this question. Mm, I would say personally, not as much as I would like. Um, I would add to that. I don't know if there could ever like be a point where I'd say there's enough any like I don't know what that would 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 be like at what point would I would say you know what I'm satisfied with how my work is touching the black community black audience all over the world kind of thing like I don't know what the metric of that would would, would be uh ultimately but that again it's something in an aspirational sense of like um I don't, as an artist, you know, feel like I have to give any particular representation to anything with my work. It's like I make the work that I make um, and people can rock with it or not. That's up to them. But I do feel a certain sense of obligation of at least presenting the work within different black communities, rich, poor, everything in between um, as best I can. Uh, and so that that that's something that, you know, with film, it's complicated. It's like you can't just 
like show up somewhere and just like show your movie right you, you can do that if you play music or something maybe but you know so it's a complicated you have to be invited places and that sort of a thing but personally i try to make every like opportunity i can to to kind of make sure that the work is touching uh, or reaching or accessible to to a black audience um because oftentimes in experimental work um and in you know my you know however many 15 year practice of making this sort of thing um these works tend to find homes in, in institutions where um black people feel um alienated um and so there's a dual job as far as i'm concerned of making it so that black people don't feel as alien in certain spaces and at the same time not putting myself in a position where I can, i'm only presenting in those spaces so working outside of you know uh those major um institutions museums etc is very important and again touches on my first point which was that uh experimental film for me is also about the alternative means of distribution and sharing of work and so you know the more we can do in terms of what we're doing with each other and what frankly is happening with this group right here just putting these things together the better off we'll all be and i think you know um that's how i approach it trying to make sure that like i can be like ready willing and able to present the work uh when i can um how i you know for the people yeah i think um for me you know like i i just you know this film is, is still is still very very new for me um and it's interesting because I, when i when i put it out like i i when i felt like okay i'm, I'm at a point where i want this film to be seen um you know, I, I I posted about it and I highlighted it and I shared it on my you know my social media, um, and then I put it on my my website. And so it's interesting, like conversations about distributions. Um, I've never really uh, delved in the, into that into that realm as much. Um, uh, so I, I don't have you know a lot of experience with with that. Um, I think from the community that that I'm a part of and that I've witnessed, I see a lot of um, like grassroots efforts to, uh, you know, put your film out there and, you know, to get a, a, a wide, um, a larger audience of people to see it. And what happens a lot of the times is that, you know, we put it out there and we put it on our website, um, you know, and that's that. And we're hoping, we're hoping that there, there's views, there's views coming from that, um, or, you know, yeah, that people are going to your page or that they're, you know, they're hitting you up and they're responding to your post about the film and that they're watching it there. Um, and yeah, going back to what Ephraim said, like, you know, platforms like this is really, really uh, impactful and it's important. Um, I've, I've been able to have my film um, in a few other places in this type of platform where people are able to come together, watch it and then have a discussion about it. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it's really important because we're bringing together a variety of films, um, you know, under one one theme, um, yeah. And I think that's really important. But uh, yeah, I would definitely want more people to watch my film. I would love to have, you know, anybody who feels like this is something that they want to uh, to witness or to see or to 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 watch. Yeah, to definitely be a part of it. Um, so I don't know. It's weird to say like, no, I don't think that it's been seen by all the people. Again, it's very new. Um, and also it's not that kind of, uh, it's, not a, it's, not a, it's not a blockbuster kind of thing. So it's weird to be like, let me distribute, you know, give it out to, you know, to everybody. And then the topic is what the topic is. Um, and so that in itself is like, well, is this going to be seen every, or, or do, will it be seen everywhere? And, and what type of spaces should it be seen? And should it be watched? So. It's kind of tricky, but um, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, um, I have to agree with everybody too. Um, I haven't shown too many other places and I try to make a lot of my work accessible online. And anytime there's programs like this, I try to be a part of it. So that way it can reach someone else. And um, yeah, but I think it was pretty answered by everyone. And, uh, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you, Terrence. Uh, thank you, Kat. Thank you, Ephraim. We're going to um, 
stop there for tonight, but we so happy to have to be showing your works um, within our platform here. And uh, for the audience, you know, Instant Ancestry is still running. Um, it will be running until November 26th. So please tune in if you haven't. Um, and if you have tuned in, uh, share with a friend and, and let them know that our program is running and that they can see the work of these fantastic filmmakers um, through November 26th. And <clears throat> excuse me, but uh, we just also want to thank Maisel's Documentary Center, Maisel Cinema, for uh, partnering with us to put on this event um, and to put on tonight's Q&A. So thank you all again for um, being a part of this. And um, we look forward to showing more of your work in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for, for, for having me and creating the space. And um, yeah, it's a pleasure. Sure. Yeah, thank you. And uh, it's good to talk with you all.